Well, good morning, Revive Church. How are you this morning? Hey, man, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful. Y'all, y'all, y'all are a group of beautiful people. I love it. I love it. I love it. I am excited to be here um, this morning. Um, as always, I want to give honor to your pastor um, and leader, Pastor Stephen Kugel. Y'all give your pastor a hand. He is family. Um, and I am honored that, you know, he would allow somebody to come in and stand in his stead while he is out being rested. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but, you know, not every, not every pastor um, allows people to come into their pulpit when they're gone. <laughs> you know, you know, people don't know how to act right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they make sure they, you know, they, they real, they real, they real temperamental about that type of stuff, Pastor Katie. Uh, but so I'm thank, I thank God that he has allowed us to be in this space um, I want to um, give honor to um, my wife. Um, I think she is still doing something with our babies in the back. Um, Pastor Shana Adams, I know you can't hear me, but I love you. Beautiful. For being here. We got some people with us, um, some friends and family. Um, y'all, I mean, y'all, y'all, know, y'all know this great man, the, the man of God, the apostle, the bishop, reverend, um, Jordan Fudge. Uh, you know, bless his holy name. You know, I am... You know, you, you, you're special when you get Jordan Fudge, you know, to come and sit with you. And so I, I love that is that is my brother. And I'm so honored to have him and my sister Asia here with him today. Um, and then we've got our family with us, some of our church family. Y'all wave, y'all wave your hands. Y'all say hello. Some of our people from Revelation City here to come say, spend some time with us this morning. And so we, we are excited to see and hear what God has to say. How many of y'all ready for the word? Okay, um, I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to do a, a very familiar passage of scripture, and I'm going to do my best to behave. Um, so y'all pray with me and for me. I, I promise you I'm going, I'm going to try to be on my best behavior. Um, in, in the meantime, while y'all turning your scriptures, y'all know how to take care of people. I walked into that room, and I saw my love language. Coffee and cookies. I mean, listen, look. We could say amen right there, you know. Coffee. I'm, I, I walked in. I told, I told the guy, my, my, my brother Justin, who's with me, I said, look. I said, look, they, they know my heart. Coffee and cookies. My God. And so I'm, I'm excited. I, I got a, ideas for that coffee already. I got all kind of recipes in the store, you know. Um, and so thank you so much for being so hospitable. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you so, so much. Y'all like Matthew 14? All right. We're going to read the text here this morning, um, starting with verse 22. It said, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, somebody hit the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked onto the water to get to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and when they got into the boat the wind ceased 
Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I want to minister a message to you this morning entitled, The Voice. The Voice. The Voice. Um, I'm going to just give you a little background about myself. I'm, I'm going to need you all to help me because um, I'm a very participatory type of guy. So, you know, um, if you speak back to me, I promise you, um, it will be good. Um, but, you know, if you look at me like I stole something, um, you, know, then, you know, it's going to make me feel like I got to preach just that much harder. Okay? So just work with me and kind of go with me for a moment. Um, and so, I, I, but before we kind of get, really get into this, I, wanna, I, want, I want your help for a moment. I like to do what I call, I want to kind of paint the picture. Um, is that okay? Just kind of give a little background. I think it's important for us to kind of understand where we are in the text before we kind of really get to our point. Is that cool? Um, here we are today. It's been a day for, for Jesus and the disciples. It's, it's been a crazy day. Um, John the Baptist was just beheaded shortly before. And if you, know, if you know Jesus and John the Baptist's relationship, they, 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 were, they were really close people. And, um, and so, so his friend, his loved one, has just been murdered. Um, and so after John the Baptist was beheaded, it, um, his disciples came and told Jesus what happened to his friend. And um, Jesus, um, you know, obviously grieving for his friend here, decided to get into a boat for a moment and go be by himself for a moment. And when he was out there trying to just kind of be in some solitude, be by himself for a moment, it's, the Bible says that the, that the multitudes heard where he was going and followed him. And Jesus, just being who he is, um, while he was in the boat, he decided when he saw the people following him, knowing that they obviously needed something from him, the Bible said that he had compassion upon them and he started ministering to them and healing their sick. Now, isn't it, the, isn't it the interesting thing about Jesus and the God that we serve that even when he is supposed to be grieving, even when he is in the place where he himself needs a moment to be by himself, but when you come with a need to him, he will put aside what he needs for a moment to come and minister and see about your needs. That's the kind of God that we serve. That he will lay aside his moment of grief for a moment and stop doing what he's doing just to come and see about you. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. So after that, shortly after that, you know, um, then the same multitude. So they didn't just come to him because they were, um, they needed people to be healed. But they also came because they was hungry. And... We heard that you can do miracles. This Jesus guy can do miracles. And we're hungry out here. And so um, uh, the disciples come to Jesus and, and they tell us, they say, look here, look here, Lord, man, listen, it's getting late. Let's go and send these people home so they have enough time to go buy them some food so they, so they can go home. And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, hold on, you know, I got a better idea. How about you feed them? And the disciples look at Jesus <laughs> with what? Um, all we got here is a cup of catfish and it's a buttermilk biscuits. <laughs> How is we going to feed all these thousands of people with these two catfish and these five Miss Butterworth biscuits? Listen, I'm telling y'all how I read the story. You hear me? I'm, I read catfish and I read buttermilk biscuits. So Jesus tells him, he said, you know what? Bring me what you have. And, you know, bring me what you have and we'll, we'll make it do what it do. And so Jesus, of course, they, of course they, they, they bring him what they have and, and, and Jesus takes what they have and he lifts it up to heaven. He prayed for it. He breaks it and he blesses it. And then we know, you know, the, all the people got fed. You know, we hear 5,000, but I want you to make sure you understand that it was actually more, more than 5,000. It had to be at least 15,000 people that were there because 5,000 were just the men, not including the women and the children. So there, there had to be at least 15,000 people that were there. 
Um, and so, so he just fed the multitude um, of people um, um, at this point in time. And then there were some people in the crowd who were so enamored, Pastor Katie, by this miracle that Jesus performed that John 6, uh, John 6 tells us that the reason Jesus had to dismiss the disciples and to dismiss the crowd because there were some people in the crowd who were so impressed by what Jesus did that his miracle pointed to the fact that he must be the prophet that they were waiting for. And so their desire was, well, now let's make him our king. Because if he's doing this, he must be the one that we're waiting for. And so we have to seize him right now while we have him. But Jesus, understanding what they were thinking, decided, listen, I need, to, this is not the time just yet for me to do that. And so before this thing is any more crazy, disciples, let me dismiss you. You going to the other side while I, could, while, while I squish this crowd away right here so we can go on about our business. Does that make sense? So he dismisses the crowd and he tells the disciples, get on to the other side to get into the boat. And once the crowds are dismissed, Jesus goes up to a mountain and begins to pray to the Father for a few hours. And, and here's now how we kind of lead up into our text where we are. Now, when the disciples got into this boat, the, the sea was about four to five miles wide. At this point in time in our text, Justin, they were at least three to four miles into their journey before the storms got really, really bad. It had been storms all night, but, but at this particular point, when we get to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, um, they, they, have been, they have been doing it for a few hours now. And at this point, the storms have got, has gotten just a little bit more rough, a little harder. They've gotten, they've gotten just that much more crazy uh, at, at this particular time. But they're three to four miles into their journey, Jordan, into a four to five mile journey. And so it's interesting, it's interesting with that. And, and one of the things I want to help people understand with that is, is it funny how it, 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 it appears as if the closer they got to their destination then the harder the opposition was. Does that make sense? They were into a four to five mile journey and they had made it three to four miles in. And so the closer they got to the finish line, all of a sudden it seemed like the harder the waves started to come. How many of you can attest to the fact when you're in a journey with Jesus and it seems like he's called you to do something and the closer you get to that thing, it seems now, now all hell want to break loose. It seems like now, it seems like everything want to start going wrong. It seems like now everything wants to start coming against me. I'm almost through. And now just things are getting a little bit too much for me to handle. I'm almost through and I'm just about done. Because we think, oftentimes, we like to think that the closer we get to a thing, the easier it becomes. We like to think that the closer we get to finishing, then the easier the journey is. But the reality is, sometimes the opposition that you're coming up against isn't necessarily to keep you from starting Sometimes your opposition is to keep you from finishing. Does that make sense in here? They told me when I was in high school, they told me that when you become a senior, that's the best year. <laughs> they said, Devondre, when you become a senior in high school, look here, you can just relax. Just take it easy. You cool. You even got to go to class if you don't want to. Lies. I seemed like I worked harder when I was a senior in high school. I was a senior in high school. I had to do ROP. I was doing ROTC. I was doing extra credit. I was throwing out trash. I was, I was cleaning up the lunchroom. I was coming early. It seemed like I worked harder as a senior. Just to get about that thing. But I made my way out, baby, with a 1.9 GPA. 
I don't care. Don't look at me like that if you don't want to. Some of y'all ain't had the best of grades either. 1.9 GPA. And that, most of that came because when they told me that I can pass math with a D, listen. You had to tell me nothing. That's all I needed to know. So I graduated, I graduated high school, Pastor K, with a 1.9 GPA. But baby, I graduated college with a 3.0, baby. Listen, <laughs> listen, I can finish better than what I started. Sometimes the opposition isn't to keep you from starting, it's to keep you from finishing. Yeah. Because the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it's not about how you start. But it's how you finish the thing that you start. Does that make sense? This narrative that we're reading, it is, it is a narrative of focused faith. Focused faith. Because at the end of the day, what, 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 I, what I want to, I want to ask you a question. And I want to put something in your spirit today. My question to you is, Revive Church, is though you may have enough faith to start, do you have enough focus to finish? That's the challenge today. This entire series is called Grow Again. And my challenge to you is going to be, do you have the ability to grow? Uh-oh, uh-oh, bless some hope. <laughs> That's all I meant. That's all I meant. Do you have the ability to finish and focus? Because if we, if we understand, if we be honest with ourselves, Jordan, there are times in your journey where your faith will be challenged and your ability to focus will be threatened. What does that mean? You had enough faith to apply. But do you have the focus to graduate? Does that make sense? You had enough faith to get the job, but do you have the focus to get to work on time? Okay. Okay. You had enough faith to block him. But do you have no focus to keep them out your DMs? All right, all right. Y'all don't like me today. You had enough faith to say I do. But do you have the focus to say I do when they get on your everlasting nerve? When the bills are due, when the lights are off, when one of y'all is sick, Will, one, will both of y'all want to kill each other? Do you have the focus to say, I still do? Y'all pray for me. You had enough faith to say yes to Jesus. But do you have the focus to live holy? Okay. Because when you are focused in your faith, one thing you learn and when you learn focus is there are some things you have to say no to. When you are in focus on a thing, you can't be a part of everything. You can't sit at every table. You can't be a part of every crowd. You can't go everywhere. There are certain things that you have to cut yourself away from when you are in a place of focus. Everybody can't be your friend when you focused. Because here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen. You can't get involved with just anybody. Why? Because if the people around you are subtracting from your focus, then they're adding to your distractions. Come on now. Come on. 
If I can't focus when I'm with you, then baby, you don't need to be around me. If I can't finish what I'm starting because I'm too busy trying to keep up with you, I'm too busy trying to go out with you. If I can't do my homework because you want to play every day, if I can't go to work because you want to stay out all night long, then baby, baby, we can't be friends right now because in this season of my life, this season is called focus. Focus finishes what faith starts. Focus finishes what faith starts. Let that resonate for a moment. Focus will complete what began in faith. Y'all following me? Let's go to the text for a moment. I just want to kind of walk through the text for a little bit. Verse 28 and 29. We understand what's happening here in the text. They're out on the boat. And the waves are coming and the waves and the, the boats are getting splashed. And, and, and the, the, boat is, the boat is being tormented by the winds and the waves. And the disciples are afraid. They're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what God is going to do. And they're out there by themselves. It's dark. It's a dark and stormy night. You know how they tell us in the stories when it's a dark and stormy night. You know, that, that, that's what they were living in that time. And, 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 and they're out there on this boat. And they see Jesus or what appears to be a ghost to them. Him, walking on the water coming toward them and they said it's a ghost and Peter had enough sense y'all know you, you know if you know Peter Peter Peter's that one <laughs> Peter is that one in the crowd you know you know Peter is gonna be that one it's a ghost really <laughs> you know you know Peter, you know Peter gonna be that one that's, that's gonna test things out and so Peter um, calls out to the Lord and said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. What I want us to understand is the tense in which that statement is written is in its original language is not really written in the tense of a question. So in other words, Peter wasn't necessarily asking, Lord, if that's you. The tense that is written in is Peter actually saying, Lord, since that's you, then you tell me to come to you. Because when I look out on the water and I see somebody doing something this impossible, there has to be nobody else in the world that can do this but you. So since that's you, tell me to come. Now, my natural human mind got to wondering. Peter, y'all was afraid while y'all was on the boat. <laughs> what would possess you to want to get out in the water? It's interesting, you know, you know, you know, people, some people just, you know, they love fear. And, you know, my wife, um, she has this, just this crazy dream. Um, she told me one day she would love to swim with sharks. And um, I told her, I said, listen, um, see, some, some things you do before you say yes. Um, before you, you know, go to the altar, there's some things you get all that out of your system. Um, because once you do that. Um, just some things we's not finna do. <laughs> and, um, and, and one of them is, you know, we's not finna get in no shark, no, no water with no sharks. Um, that, that, that's just, listen, I, that's, not, that's not our ministry, you know. <laughs> that's not, that's not what, we, what we're here for, you know. So, you know, so some people just like, you know, just dangerous stuff like that. So Peter, you know, he gets out on the boat, and I'm like, I'm like, wow, I, I just, it's, just, it's just interesting how he would want to climb out and get into this thing. But, you know, that's, that's just Peter. That's just, that's just who he was. And when he got out the boat 
and he began walking towards Jesus, um, I, I began to realize one simple thing is that although it may look crazy to our natural mind, but what I found out in my journey with God is sometimes when, you are, when your faith is rooted in Jesus, sometimes it'll make you feel like you can do anything. When you have the faith that's rooted in Jesus, I'm talking about a real faith, a real faith that's rooted and grounded in who Jesus is, then sometimes that thing will empower you to feel like you can walk on water, to feel like you can overcome anything that's coming at you. And so when your faith is really grounded and rooted in who Jesus is, it'll cause you to begin to, to ask God some crazy things. It'll cause you to ask God to do and to empower you to do some things that to the natural mind may sound crazy. When your faith is really rooted in Jesus, it'll cause you to start looking for a house when your credit is bad. You hear me in here today? When your faith is really rooted in Jesus, listen, it'll, it'll cause you to start getting, getting prepared for a marriage and you ain't even got a date yet. You feel me? Because when your faith is rooted and grounded in who Jesus is, then you have a, you have a reason to, 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 to kind of sink your anchor in his word for your life. You have a reason to sink your anchor in his promises for your life. And even when it doesn't look like it at the moment, but when your faith is rooted in who he is, you can hold on to the fact that it may not be here just yet, but because he said it in his word, I can bank on it right now and I can begin to make my moves toward that thing. And one day, maybe it'll just just kind of come does that make sense you got that towel for me faith will always require a response ladies and gentlemen faith will always require a response it is not enough just to believe and never do. It is not enough to believe that God can and you never take him at his promise. It is not enough to imagine what the possibilities can be and never move forward on that thing. Faith isn't faith until you bust a move. So some of y'all, you tell yourself, I got faith, but you're still stuck in the same place. Some of you would tell yourself, well, yeah, I'm just believing God and you ain't moved anything. Your faith requires you to respond to it. Because what faith really is, is an invitation to the next level. And you can believe God all you want to. But if your belief isn't followed by behavior, then it's delusion. Does that make sense? But I want you to understand something. Watch Watch the text. Notice Peter didn't move based off of what he saw. He only moved based off what he heard. Does that make sense? Peter, even in a dark and stormy situation, when it's dark and it's rainy and violent winds and you're probably being tossed and driven by everything around you, it's hard for you to see. But Peter had enough history with Jesus. He had enough experience with the Lord that even when I can't see, but if I can hear his voice in the midst of a storm, then all I need to do is move because I have enough history to know his voice when he speaks. I can't see just yet, but I can hear him talking. The Bible says, my sheep know my 
voice. My question to you is, are you really a sheep? Because it's interesting, we live in a world where we like to tell people we're all God's children. Lie. The Bible says that we are all his creation, but we are not all his children. Because the Bible talks about that is when you become a child of God, it's because you have received the spirit of adoption. And so if I have to adopt you, that means I have to take you from one family and bring you over into another. So until you have been adopted, baby, baby, you are just a foster child. You are not part of the family yet. You are not my child just yet until you have said yes to me as your father. See, we live in a world where we, we, it, it's cute to say, you know what? Listen, we can live how we want to live, do what we want to do, because we're all God's children. You know, you know, God loves us all. Yes, he does. He loves every single one of us, baby. He loves every single one of us. And yes, we're all his creation. Black, white, blue, purple, green, and yellow. I don't care. We are all his creation. But until you say yes to him, then guess what? One of us is different. I know we don't like that type of gospel. We, 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 don't, we don't want to hear that type of stuff. But the reality is that until we both say yes, baby, yeah, we, 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 we may be coming up to the same functions. We may be doing the same thing. But baby, one of us got privileges that the other one doesn't. One of us is a family. One of us is a child. And the other one, baby, you just visiting here. I live here. This is my family. This is my daddy. I'm, I'm a part of this family. So, so, here's the interesting thing about mature faith. Mature faith doesn't require God to show his face. Because mature faith says, as long as I have his voice, then that's really all I need. Mature faith says, can I trust his voice even when I can't trace his face? Mature faith says, can I hear what he's saying and move based off what he's saying even when I don't see his face at hand? Even when I don't see the full plan, the full picture, the full reality of this thing, but just because he told me I could, can I move off of that? Mature faith. Here's my question to you, Revived Church. What's the Lord telling you right now? Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> What's the Lord telling you? And here's the part B to that. What's the Lord telling you that you have yet to move on? What's the Lord telling you that you have yet to respond to? What is the Lord whispering in your ear that you have yet to bust a move on? Is it your career? Is it your education? Is it your family? Is it your deliverance? Is it your friendships? Is it your relationships? Is it your finances? What is it that he's telling you that you have yet to respond to? Because it ain't faith without your response. Y'all follow me. Verse 30 says that when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And then Jesus stretched out his hand and said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I want to help you understand something for a moment. Um, sir, 
in the sound booth. Um, help me out for a moment. Mm -hmm. This is what faith looks like sometimes. Dark. You can't see everything. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes you're trying to move in faith and you can't really see what's around you all the way. Sometimes faith says, can you trust the whisper in the dark? Sometimes faith says, hey, I know it's hard to see me right now, but can you hear my voice? And if you can hear my voice, clap once. If you can hear my voice, will you respond to it? If you could hear my voice, then will you follow what I'm telling you to do? I know you probably can't see everything in front of you right now, but do you have enough faith to hear even what I'm telling you in the moment? See, some of us, we like to hear God with the full plans of everything. But sometimes what we have to understand about faith is that faith operates in steps. And so sometimes God will never, never really give you the full picture in that moment. Why? Most of the time you can never handle the full picture. But can you trust? the little steps that he gives you and can you trust the little inklings that he gives you can you trust the little the little inclinations that he gives you can you trust the little information that he gives you because real faith asks the question can I trust God with limited information focused faith does that make sense When Jesus asked Peter, why did you doubt? That word doubt in the original language, Larry, it means to be drawn in two different directions. So Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, why were you drawn in another direction from me? Why did you take your eyes off of me and put it into another direction? Why did you doubt? Because the reality is Peter didn't start sinking until he started looking at something that was different from what he heard. Because like us, we like to see it before we can believe it. But real faith says, I can believe it even when I haven't seen it. Because if I have to see it to believe it, then it isn't faith. Can I believe it when I have no way to trace it? Why do you think when Jesus came back from the grave and he began having a conversation with the disciples and he told Thomas, he said, listen, uh, Thomas was like, look, I won't believe it until I see the, 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 the thorn prints in, in, his, in his hands and I won't believe it until I see the hole in his side. And, and Peter gave him, he said, listen, okay, if, you, if that's what you need to believe, then here it is. Take a look. Here it is. He said, he said, okay, well, good. Now I believe. And Jesus said, that's good. That's cute. You, you believe because you saw it, but blessed is he who can believe without seeing a thing. Blessed is he who can believe simply because of your experience with me. Blessed is he who can believe just because I said it. Blessed is he who can believe even when you have no idea on how to see it yet. Blessed is he who can believe without having to see. Peter heard the word, but he got distracted by the wind. He heard the word, but he got distracted by the waves. What do you do 
when the wind, when the voices of the winds are higher than the voices of his word. What do you do when the voices of your distractions are talking louder to you than the word that he's given you? What do you do when you have all your friends in your ear? What do you do when too many thoughts are in your head? What do you do when there's so many other things that are vying for your attention? What do you do when the things around you are threatening your attention? How do you respond to those things when the voices of the winds are louder than the voices of his word to your life? And the reason and the reality for many of us is the reason why we cannot move forward and you are not able to finish what you're starting is because your distractions are too loud. Some of us need to log off of social media. Some of us need to turn the TV off. You're too distracted to focus. Some of us need to tell your friends, I can't talk right now. You're too distracted to focus and you're wondering why you can't finish anything because you got so much going on in your head. And you have to come to a decision to refuse to be anybody's brain dump. Because once they unload on you, guess what? They free, you heavy. What do you do with your distractions? Revive Church, listen. Distractions can never keep you where Jesus called you. Your distractions can never keep you where Jesus called you. Why? Because at any point when you are divided in your attention... You will never be able to focus truly on Jesus. The scriptures make it very clear. You can't serve God and serve another master. Either you're going to hate one and you're going to love the other. But baby, we both can't have the same space. And so in this moment where I'm calling you to do something and I'm calling you to finish something, I'm calling you to a level of focus, I'm calling you to go after that thing, either you're going to have to make a choice or whether you're going to go after this thing full-fledged or you're going to be stuck in your distractions. And guess what? If you're going to be stuck in your distractions, don't come complaining to me 20, 30 years down the line wondering why your life looks the way it looks, wondering why things ain't quite adding up and you're wondering why things just ain't quite happening for you. Why? because 20, 30 years ago when I tried to get your attention back then you chose your distractions and now you're wondering why your life is all jacked up. Now you're wondering why your life looks the same way. It's because you chose to have a divided attention. Lest we do, and I'm almost done here, lest we do what we often tend to do when we're reading the scriptures Y'all know we like to make ourselves the hero of the story. We like to read this text. Peter walked on water. And Peter becomes the object of the story. Here's the reality. Jesus wasn't calling Peter to the water. He was calling Peter to himself. Does that make sense? Jesus was inviting Peter to a new level of faith in him. A new place in God that he had never experienced before. 
because many scholars question why in the world did Peter ask this question in the first place. And then when you read other commentaries and you read other studies and research models, what they tell is the reason why Peter had enough gall and enough boldness to ask this question was because in Peter's mind, if this is my leader, and if this is the person that I'm following, and if this is the person that I'm subscribing my faith to, then if he can walk on water, I want to be able to do what I see my leader doing. I want to be able to do what I see this person I'm following doing. And so, baby, if you can walk on water, then God called me to do what you do I want to follow what you said I can do I want to follow your pattern I want to follow your authority I want to if you can do it God I want to do it too that's the power of having a leader who goes before you because real students want to follow their leaders And they say, listen, if the grace that's on your life to walk on this thing, I want that same grace too. Whatever the grace is on your leader, if it's for debt, if it's for money management, if it's for relationships, if it's for leadership, if it's for marriage, whatever it is, I want what's on your life. I want the grace that you have. And because if I'm here following you, then guess what that means? I got access to do what I see you doing. Come on, musicians. Revive Church. I want to help you understand something. Y'all stand for stand with me for a moment. I just believe that there is something that the Lord wants to share and do in this space for a moment, if that's all right. Y'all come on, lift your hands for a moment. Lift your hands for a moment. I, when, I, when I began praying about this word for you this week, and I began to ask God what it was that he was doing, what it was that he was saying, um, for Revived Church, and here's what, I, here's what I have for you. Revived Church, every single person in this church, you're getting ready to walk into a new level of unprecedented focus. You're getting ready to walk into a new level of unprecedented focus. And God is getting ready to breathe life into your concentration. And the very things that you are getting ready to put your hands to. And the thing that you're getting ready to put your hands in and put your feet toward. God says, I'm ready to breathe life into your expectation. I'm ready to breathe life into your concentration. And the thing that you're getting ready to set out to do, whether it's career, whether it's money, whether it's finances, whether it's your education, whether it's your family. He says, I'm I'm getting ready to curse the spirit of delay. I'm getting ready to curse the spirit of incompletion. He says, I'm getting ready to breathe life into your focus. And you're not going to be a people who's going to just start a thing. But you're going to be those who will finish what you started. He said, I'm getting ready to show you that I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. And the grace that's on me to start a thing, I'm going to release that grace to you to be a finisher. You're going to be, you will be a house that finishes. You will be a house that finishes finishes what you started you will put your hand to the plow and you will finish what you started go back to that business plan go back to that career go back to that job go back to that family go back to that dream you're going to finish what you started come on in this place let them lift up your hands lift up your hands begin to praise God right where you are God I pray right now in the name of Jesus that the great that the finishing grace of God will be in this place and you're going to move and you're going to allow your people to finish what they started and that he that has begun a good work in you he will carry it on to completion come on come on come on come on listen some of you in here this message is for you and I'm going to invite Pastor Katie do we have about five or seven minutes yeah if this is for you I want to invite you to the altar for a moment and I want to pray with you if you know that you've been one that you've been struggling with finishing you've got some assignments on the table you've got some things that you've left undone you got some things that you've been wanting to get done and wanting to complete but it seems like everything is coming against you and it is hard to finish 
it's hard to complete it. You've lost your motivation for it. You've lost your passion for it. You've lost your drive for it. And now you're trying to figure out how do I finish this thing? How do I make this thing happen? God, I know you gave me these dreams. I know you gave me these plans and you gave me these passions. I know you gave me these things here and I want to make sure that I don't leave this year. I want to make sure that I don't walk out of this place and not finishing the thing that you said I could do. I want to make sure that I don't leave this place undone. I refuse to be one who goes to the grave and have dreams that have never been met. I refuse to be the one that goes into and be the one in my family who have dreams and callings that have yet to be realized. I will be the product and the template in my family. I will be that one that helps people to understand that if I can, if you call me to it, you can finish this thing. I will not be the one who will just stop midway and stop and get distracted by the things that are coming up against me. But I will be a one who will finish the thing that he started. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Open your mouth for a moment. Just let the Lord hear you for a moment. 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 Come on, come on, come on, come on. This ain't the time to quit, ladies and gentlemen. This ain't the time to be distracted. This ain't the time to give up. Jesus came to them in the fourth watch of the night. If you know anything about the fourth watch, it is the pre-dawn time of the day. It is the time of the day where the night is ending and the light is getting ready to break forth. And I want you to understand something, that we are in the fourth watch of the year. And hey, what, I, what I mean by that is, you are at the time of the year where 2023 is on its way into the world. But don't you stop now in the fourth watch. Don't you get distracted in the fourth watch because Jesus is right here with you in the fourth watch. Jesus wants to walk you through and make sure you finish what you started. Come on, let's pray. While we pray for them, you pray. And if, you, if you're not at this altar, stretch forth your hands. I just believe God's going to do a mighty work in this room today. And I just believe that we're not going to leave here the same way we came in. We're not going to leave just another Sunday and just doing just another thing. But I believe that God is going to breathe on your finishing grace in this place.